today, with your help, we are launching, launching a new initiative called Mindset Matters, a campaign that uses the concept of growth mindset and the power of yet to encourage individuals to challenge themselves and others to reach their full potential. And of course, the library is here to help. The concept of growth mindset was developed by psychologist Carol Dweck and popularized in her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. I try to have a copy of it here to show you, but it's checked out. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. Simply put, a fixed mindset is the belief that ability and intelligence are static. A growth mindset is the belief that anything can be learned with work and practice and effort. This is where your library comes in. The library is a perfect incubator for ability and intelligence to evolve and to flourish. With free classes, programs, and online resources, your library is uniquely positioned to, to make the connections to help you unleash your full potential. Today's program features local people who embody a growth mindset. Local entrepreneur Sarah Beyer, non-traditional student Jodel Wogu, library employee Angela Meadows, and library director Brian McCormick will share how they have grown and changed in their lives and careers, and how being flexible in their thinking and learning has been of great value. I'm your moderator, the library's head of access services, Michelle Dennis. With all the change that happens around us every day, from technology to weather, we are constantly being challenged to employ a growth mindset. It's a choice we have to make every day to believe that we can, even when sometimes we might feel like we can't, to say and to believe in the power of yet. So let's review. What is a mindset? A growth mindset is the ability to learn and to change throughout our lives. Have you heard that phrase, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? It's not true. You can always teach your dog new tricks, and you can always learn new tricks yourself. Sometimes it takes a little bit more time and a little bit more effort, and perhaps even different effort. But we can learn new things throughout our lives. Our biggest barrier is, guess what, ourselves. All of the emotions that we might feel going into a new project. You know that feeling when something new comes up, that new piece of technology, that cool new cell phone, and you think, oh, holy crap, I don't know if I can do that. But let me tell you that the newest research into human physiology shows us that an emotional response, that physiological heart rate going up, palms sweating a little bit, lasts for 90 seconds, 90 seconds. And if we can maintain our composure and ride out that wave, we can, we can then pick up, regain our balance, and continue on. Experiencing an emotion, continuing to be afraid, continuing to feel panic for more than 90 seconds is habit, is mm, being entrenched in a behavior. It isn't necessary. And we can make a choice any time after that 90 seconds to let it go and move on. And that's one of the things that we're here today to encourage you to think about and to do. So how do you change a mindset? Well, there's lots of different ways to do it. But I would propose that one step is to challenge yourself to see things in new ways, or even more than one way. Have you seen this before? What do you see? How, what's that? Two faces. How many of you see a young woman? How many of you see an old woman? What do you see first? The young, I heard about e equal, the young woman and the old woman. What about this one? Is that a face, or is it a, two faces, or is, is it a vase? Yay. So if you, can, if you instantly see both, it might be experience. That might be something you've learned. And it might also be that your, your mind and your eyes are letting you have that experience. How many pegs? 
And how do they connect? And could this object exist in real life? Ask yourself, am I sure that I'm seeing what's really there? How many legs does this elephant have? And how do they connect? Fun, huh? Am I seeing what I expect to see? It's a cat, right? It's a really creepy cat, right? <laughs> I love Escher. And I, I, to tell you the truth, some of my favorite people in the whole wide world, after I've gotten to know them a little while, have Escher pictures hanging in their house. Because Escher was kind of the master of bending your mind a little bit and, and making you aware that things happen that our minds can conceive, even if they can't really exist in the real world. Which way are these birds flying? Well, it depends, right? Which kind of birds are you looking at? And where in the world is Waldo? <laughs> so changing your mindset is a process. And we can start small and hopefully have fun with it. But a little bit at a time is the way that, well, we accomplish pretty much anything. So what we're going to do today is listen to some stories, listen to the life stories of four really special people. And I had the great pleasure of first introducing my boss, the library director, Brian McCormick. And he's going to talk about growth mindset and how being in a growth mindset has helped him decide to initiate the library's capital campaign and physical transformation. He has started adding the word yet to statements that can be limited. I can't do that yet. The library doesn't offer that yet. We don't have the technology. Say it with me now, yet. So Brian, would you join us at the front table? And thank you for sharing your story today. Yes, please. Please be comfortable. <laughs> and we're on? OK, good. Well, I guess thank you for inviting me <laughs> and for being here on this Sunday. Um, what I thought I would do is maybe talk a little bit about myself. And I've always been someone open to change. So that's helped me a little bit. Um, I'm not exactly sure how maybe it was as a kid building Lego and I'd be done and it's like, okay, it's cool, but it can be better. And then you tear it down and you build something new. So I've always been someone kind of open to what else can we do? How can we improve it? How can we take that next step? So I've kind of always been there. Now I'm doing some other trainings and being involved with some people. They've helped me understand, you know, to continue to grow. Um, and that's helped me. And, and, you know, it's like, okay, we're not there yet, but what can we do? What do we need to get on the path to get there? Um, some people struggle with that, and I'll give a, um, some help for those that might struggle. So if you're somebody that hears an idea and your first impulse is, yeah, but, yeah, but, we had an instructor that showed us a picture of a big old elephant butt. And those butts are getting in the way. So whenever you're, you're ready to say, yeah, but, think of that big old elephant butt getting in your way. And then stop yourself and think a minute. It's like, OK, what can I do to get past that and move forward? Because the, the one thing, we're doing things, we're changing because there's always this future or there's opportunity to do something better. And that's what we want to get into. So we want to get into that mindset that, you know, what we're doing right now, it's nice, but it can be improved. It can be better. We can do things a little bit differently. So if you're someone that struggles, just kind of think of that as like, okay, hold your tongue a minute. Maybe don't say something. Come back. Think about it and then try and get on that same mindset to move forward. So it's kind of a little something there to help those out. But 
Um, a few years back, I, well, what, what has it been? I think I've been on a state committee. I think it's going on six years now. So I've been here for a few years, and um, you know there was a three-year gap between library directors. So there was a lot of things that kind of needed to kind of take place and get done here. So I spent my time doing that, and then I found myself at a point where okay, I'm ready for some of those new challenges. And there were things going on at the state level with libraries. So I was like, okay, I'm ready to do something new. And I was lucky enough to get appointed by the governor to the Council on Library Network Development. So here's a, a great way to get involved at the state level with things happening in libraries. And to hear about you know, not only things going on in public libraries, but also the academic libraries, school libraries, special libraries, what have you, but uh, a lot of neat things going on in libraries. And for the first couple of years, I was kind of feeling my way, um, seeing a lot of what's going on. Then the other council members decided to appoint me as a vice president or vice chair, and now I'm chair. So it, it's been a great learning process for me and involvement. But along the way, as you're involved in state activities, you're also seeing what other people are doing and what the state's direction was. And they're bringing ideas that are happening at other states. And so we're looking at this report that came out. And it was based on what some of the leading libraries around the nation were doing. And it was from the Aspen, the Aspen report. And they had gone into libraries and, show, and seen that basically there's three things kind of going on. And they're focusing on people, place, and platform. The libraries are a place where people feel comfortable going to and being involved in things. That the library as place is a comfortable location. It has your technology. It has your, your meeting rooms. It has an opportunity for people to come and feel involved. And then there's the platform and that all these new ideas or community groups uh, focusing on something or social groups or what have you, they have an ability to kind of talk about what it is that they're doing and share with others. So kind of with, with that as a guide, libraries were changing up how they were structured. You, you saw uh, libraries being reconstructed with more rooms for space for small groups to come in and study or work on things or more uh, seating areas, uh, more program rooms. You know, so with our project, we're improving this room and making it more accessible and a little bit bigger and, and better with technology, adding a room up or a door up on front so we can be open before and after we're closing. So we, we're changing that up so we're more accessible that way adding more group study rooms, but adding technology to it. So one of the things you're seeing is collaboration is a, a very big thing in today's schools, in the workplace, and people need the opportunity to get together and work three or four, having a, a computer or the screen or some ability to hook up to that so they can share their ideas and work together. Um, and then just you know changing up the library and make it a little bit more uh, friendly. We're adding kiosks as well, so we're not a, situated behind a, a desk and we're waiting for you to come and ask a question. We'll have kiosks at various places around the library so you know, staff can get up and mingle with the patrons as well and ask questions. You kind of see this a little bit in retail too where you're a little bit more mobile. Um, but in changing that, instead of focusing our librarians behind a desk, we're going to free them up so they can also go into the community too and be involved. A uh, quick example of what that can be, I mean, just on Friday, I was at a bank and just in conversation, uh, the, the banker said they were having trouble with their Reference USA database. And I said, well, we've got the same database. Let me ask our staff if they've experienced a similar problem. So it's it's not that you have to go out and create a partnership all the time, but you want to be out in the community and you want to talk to people and create relationships and then something else will come along uh, later on. 
Uh, one of the neat things with our uh, philanthropic project that we're doing to raise funds is that we've now reached out and met people that we never did before. Uh, whether it's a business or a foundation, you get to meet them, you get to hear you know, what's important to them or what they like to see. So that just kind of broadens your perspective too. So every time you're, you're able to do these new things or meet new people, that just broadens your horizon as well. So you got all these other ideas now that can you know, maybe influence your future or some other things you do or you have people you can reach back out to. It's like, hey, I got this really neat idea for a project. Is this something that you might be interested in? I know we kind of talked about this before. So, you know, kind of a lot of those things that, you know, we're setting ourselves up so that we can be more involved with the community. The, the library will be able to accommodate more activities or collaborative activities. It'll also be, a, you know, it's been 20 years, so the carpeting and lighting, all that stuff needs to be improved. So it's going to be a nice uh, location to be at as well. So we're doing all these things so that we are set for the future. And the other thing kind of with the way we're restructuring is that most of our construction is kind of on the outside. That whole middle area is still fairly flexible. So 20 years, things are different again, and I can't... I can't predict 20 years, I'd like to. I kind of have some ideas of what some stuff is going to be like. But there will be that ability to make some changes as well. So we're not doing a project that's going to lock uh, you know, construction into a certain way. I mean, the library's still going to be flexible, so we will make those changes and all that. So um, for myself, you know, and then my getting myself involved in the state was one thing. That then opened up the opportunity for me to be involved in the Public Library System Revision Project, where I'm a steering committee member, and also on the Resource Library Work Group. And the neat part about that project is that we're now setting up uh, the state systems and how they support libraries. So the statutes have been, hadn't been changed in you know, 40, 50 years, really, for the most part how systems have been supporting libraries for the most part remain the same except for the fact that you saw some automation consortiums getting uh, put together. Now we, we've pulled together, you know, there's, there's people from all over the state involved in this project. So it just wasn't like 10 or 12 people getting together and creating this. It was, there's librarians from small libraries up north you got the people from the Milwaukee and Madison area, myself and a couple other people from Rock County are involved. Uh, we actually have some academic librarians, some school librarians. But all of us are getting together and saying, okay, what is it we want systems to do for our libraries and our patrons of the state? So we've been working on this project for a couple of years and we'll be bringing our report out well, the first draft will be in February, we'll get to work on that, and then in May we're presenting it to the, uh, uh, the library world at the conference in May. So uh, an opportunity uh, that I was looking to involve myself, see what I can offer, and be involved in making things change for the better for, for people in the state of Wisconsin. So anyway, that's kind of my story. <laughs> <laughs> that I have. Is it okay Excellent. to answer questions? Yeah, you or, bet. If there's any questions in particular about the project, I'd be willing to answer them now, otherwise I can hold until later too. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Brian. <laughs> Sarah, will you come and join us? Am I slow without a microphone? Would everybody, can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. I'm more comfortable without a microphone. Okay. So if you, use my power, yes. you're welcome to go ahead and you're welcome to stand if you wish. You're welcome to sit. I'm a mover and a shaker. So. A mover. She's a mover. <laughs> Sarah Byer is an entrepreneur and she is a walking billboard for growth mindset. She started her own successful business, then made the difficult decision to close it to be home with her kids and is now flourishing in online sales. She has actually been asked to teach or speak at conferences after only being with that company for a little over a year. So thank you and welcome. Um, so oddly, prior to being asked to speak at this, I'm going to stand right here so I can 
I made notes, so I like to ramble, so keep me on track. <laughs> but um, prior to this, I had never heard of growth mindset or the power of yet, and um, which is bizarre because it turns out that I live, eat, and breathe the power of growth. Like I've just always believed that I can do anything. Um, not even just that I can do anything. I believe that anybody can do anything. If you if you truly want it, you can find a way to make it happen. No matter how crazy of a dream that may be, it is possible because if you want it bad enough, you're gonna find a way. And a lot of the times you might not um, say this is your dream, this is what you're aiming for. You have to learn and you have to grow and you have to work on so many things to get to that point that while you're reaching for that dream, you might find out that you actually wanna go here. So even if you don't get to that, that point, you're, you're still flourishing and you're still growing because it's taken you to a whole new level. So I don't really see anything I do as a failure, even if this is my goal and this is where I'm trying to get to, but I get to here instead. I'm really happy because I wouldn't have gotten to here if I wasn't aiming for there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that, it was really neat to find out because once I was invited to learn this, then I dug into growth mindset to see what it was. And I was like, oh, how cool, I do that. So, yeah. um, so I'm looking forward to reading all those great books in the back. Um, I am going to share with you, when I was 18 years old, I was diagnosed with bipolar, and um, in turn, I didn't graduate high school. So that's not something that most people would share with others, but I'm sharing it with you because I didn't look at that as an excuse. I totally could have used those as, I can't get this job, you need a high school diploma, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. Never once did I look at any doors being closed to me which a lot of doors are closed to me because of these things, but I don't see it like that. I, I look at that door and I'm like, okay, it's closed right now. I can't get in yet, but I'm gonna find a way. So I look at it more as like one of those puzzle boxes that you have to sit and choose <laughs> and then, you know, and I'll work my way and I'll find my way in. If I wanna get in that door, I'm gonna get in that door. So I think that's important that you just look at life like that, that there's gonna be so many obstacles and so many challenges and there's gonna be so many people telling you no if you believe, if you believe that it's a yes, it can be a yes. You just, you just have to believe strong enough within yourself and you can find a way to make that happen. Um, okay. So pretty much that's growth mindset, which mm -hmm. how cool is that, right? Like, mm -hmm. so now, now I've got a name for it. Now I can tell people what that is. Um, now when seeing that door, I'm really big on analogies, so I'm gonna run with this door for a second. But a lot of people with uh, fixed mindsets they're gonna see that door and they're gonna be like, oh shoot, the door's closed. And then they're gonna go and do something else. Where if you've got growth mindset, you're gonna see that door and it might be something as simple as just turning the handle. But if you've got a fixed mindset, you're not gonna to try to turn that handle or you're not gonna ask for a key or you're not gonna knock or whatever needs to be done to get through that door. But with growth mindset, you look at that door and you find, you find your way in. So that's, that is growth mindset. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I, when my daughter was younger, she's actually, she's actually here, she was in dance, and I danced at age, I started dance at age three, I wanted, my dream was to be on the Johnny Carson show. It obviously wasn't a huge dream, I never got there. But, <laughs> but um, I danced all my life. So when my daughter was six, I enrolled her in dance. The, the current studio that she was at, one of the teachers quit. Um, just didn't show up for work and they knew I was a dancer and they asked if I would teach and I was like it had been years So I was like, oh my gosh, so I was like, okay, sure I will fill in for you Well, I filled in for them and I ended up being one of their main teachers Well, I didn't really like how they ran things so so I quit and they were very angry about that and um, You know, which is fine people choose choose whatever I didn't let that ruin my happy I just continued on well, after doing so, I had a lot of my students um, contacting me, wanting me to continue teaching them dance. So I finally gave, I mean, it was after like a month of just begging, and so finally I was like, okay, I have a studio in my basement, and I'll teach a couple kids. So I started with nine kids in my basement, um, and those nine kids turned into 20 kids, and then I just kept, more and more kept coming. And in the meantime, I was still teaching at another studio in a different city. Um, but more kids kept coming, so I was like, okay, you know what, I think I'm going to just open up a dance studio, because obviously the demand is here. So, um, now mind you, i not a high school graduate, I have no, I had no business training whatsoever, um, and really like, 
back in the day, I was an amazing dancer. I was, I was, I mean, that sounds really, but I was, I was good, dang it. Um, but I hadn't danced for a long time, so I was very rusty. But I was like, you know what, the, the dance studio is needed, I'm gonna make this happen. So, um, I just jumped in. I just jumped in and I was like, I'm gonna open a dance studio. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even really think about the what ifs, like, oh, this could happen and that could happen, or the, the building is so expensive, how am I gonna pay for that? I just knew if I build it, they will come, you know? So I did, so I, I built a dance studio and then um, within my first year, I had a little, little under 100 students, which that was crazy because I wasn't, I wasn't anticipating that. I was just gonna have a little tiny, you know, for my 40, my 40 kids and that's, I was just gonna leave it at that. Um, well, I then had to learn to hire teachers because I was only at a certain level of dance, so I needed to get other teachers to, um, that could teach my more advanced students. So I found teachers. I had to learn marketing. I've never done anything with marketing. I had to learn um, payroll, you know, just all these things that I, I was nowhere near qualified for. But when those obstacles came in front of me, I didn't, they didn't come to me and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this, and I ran. I was like, okay, I'm gonna figure this out. And I did, so, um, and I had my dance studio, and it was very successful. I did very well for um, nine years. And then after nine years, I realized that this is taking up too much of my life. I had three girls, and um, I was literally putting in at least 70 hours a week, because even if I wasn't at the studio, I was working at home and like I might have been with my kids, but I was still working. I was constantly working and I was like, that's not fair to my family. Um, I, need, I need to stop, I need to sell the studio. And that was really hard for me, but um, it was something I needed to do because, because I jump in with, with both feet, I'm not able to just half anything. So it's like I couldn't hire people to run the studio for me. I kind of started going on that route and training people to do that, but I, I, I wasn't capable of just kind, you know, just owning the dance studio and having other people run it. So I had to, I had to let go of that. Which was, it's still kind of to this day really hard because I miss those. Those were my babies, so I, I miss all my all my families and all that. But um, during during owning the dance studio, I accidentally, I just accidentally do things. <laughs> um, I had a competition team that traveled, and makeup was very expensive. So I signed up for a direct sales company solely so my dancers could get the discount on their makeup because they needed high quality makeup while they were on stage. So just going and getting Maybelline or you know anything that it wasn't going to work for stage makeup. But the makeup they needed was very expensive. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do direct sales so that my dancers can get this discount. And so I did that. And, um, and I just kind of accidentally started selling it because I started using the products and I loved the products. And then so I was... I just talked about it and, and shared it with others and because I was so excited about it, they were excited about it and then suddenly I started growing a team of people under me and I was like, what is happening? I, I, just, I just wanted a discount for my dancers. And um, so then I was like, I'll dig a little into that. Well, I'm glad that I did that because that allowed me to sell my studio and be home with my children because I had the direct sales. Um, to lean on, so I, so I wasn't completely losing my income. I had the direct sales to lean on. Well, when I sold the studio, I switched direct sales companies also, so it was almost like a little midlife crisis, <laughs> but <laughs> I switched direct sales companies, and because that was now my, that was going to be my sole income, I needed to be able to make money on that. I put my all into it, and I got to the top of the company, um, which isn't easy. There's not many people do that it's quick, they, they can do it, but it's normally like a five-year plan. I did it in two months, and um, it didn't even feel like work because I was just, it was just part of my life, and I was just doing it, and I was sharing it, and um, so that's really cool. So I was able to do that. So I've been doing this for a year now. I've still, I've got a, a fairly large team under me, and, and I'm loving it, but I wanted more because I was used to, I was used to every minute of the day being accounted for at the dance studio, and I just I needed I needed that busyness. So I decided um, I was I was very good with makeup, and I had taken classes and all of that. And I decided I wanted to be a makeup artist. Well, you can't be a makeup artist unless you go to school and get a certificate and be certified to be a makeup artist. 
you can't go to school unless you have a high school diploma. I didn't have that. Um, now you'd think the easy way is go, go and get your HSED and then you can do that, right? Totally could have taken that route. I didn't, I chose not to. Instead, there's all kinds of classes that I could take. They're not, they're not cheap, but I chose to just take these classes and just better educate myself. And I pretty much gave myself the education of to become a makeup artist, I just wouldn't have that degree. And I was fine with that. I was fine with not having that degree, whatever. Um, I then got invited um, to attend this makeup artist meeting, which is like a get together that they, every month they get together and they speak. And these are makeup artists that work on Lady Gaga and like they just travel the world and just they've got, their clients are high end. And I couldn't understand why they were inviting me. Like I, I do makeup for housewives in Janesville. Like, why are you inviting me to this? So I was very intimidated. And it took me two months to get myself to actually go to that meeting. Um, I just didn't feel like I was worthy. I didn't feel like, you know, like they, to me, were like celebrities. And they, they've all went to school and they all mastered their art. And I was just like, you know, a little Janesville girl that puts makeup on people. Like, it just didn't, even though I am very skilled with makeup, I just didn't feel like it. I wasn't yet. I wasn't ready yet. I wasn't ready yet. So after two months, I finally decided, you know what, I'm going to go to that meeting. And I went. And it, it opened so many doors for me because I, I, I just needed to believe in myself and get myself there. And um, so I'm now happy to say that I am a certified makeup artist. And I did not have to go to high school or college to do so. Um, because, I was, because I've attended so many classes and because I go to so many workshops, they were able to uh, grandfather me in um, just by, by my effort and by my, my ability. So that's really cool. So it's, I shared that story with you mainly because it's proof that if you believe it can happen, you can find, you can find a way. You just, you, just have to, you just have to believe in it. And, but you have to work for it too. You can't just put it out there and be like, okay. It's not happening, but you have to put in the work and then it can happen. Um, another thing is I, I, was, I was aimed really high. Like I set, I set my goals to here. Like if this is where I'm wanting to be, this is where I set my goals to be. I know I'm not gonna reach this goal and I probably will never, ever, ever reach this goal. But if I set my goal to here, once I reach that, once I get there, I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to be like, yeah, I did it. And I'm not going to push myself any farther because I just reached my goal. So I'm going to celebrate and I'm going to be like, yeah, and I'm going to be done and I'm going to move on to the next thing. But if my goal is right here, I am for sure going to hit this goal because how can you not hit that goal if you're aiming that much higher? And then once I do hit that goal, I'm going to keep on pushing because I'm like, okay, I made it here. Now let's see if I can get there, right? So. I think if you, and, that, and I don't want you to set crazy goals. Like if you set a goal up to here, you need to know that you're not going to reach that goal. So I don't, I'm very leery on telling people set insanely high goals because a lot of people get disappointed if they don't get there. So only set your goals that high if you know within yourself that you're not gonna get down on yourself and you're gonna celebrate every victory along the way. Because if you celebrate all those victories, it doesn't matter if you hit that goal or not because you're really happy that you that you hit all those things and it's going to open so many so many more doors for you so that's that is my story excellent thank you thank you very much wow i hope you're starting to feel inspired so i have another mind-bending puzzle for you underneath your chair you'll find a scissors and two pieces of paper and what I'd like you to do is grab that scissors and one piece of paper. Go ahead and grab your scissors. Grab your scissors. Come on. You can do that. And I'm going to have you take one of your pieces of paper and cut a shape. Cut a shape. Don't think about it too much. Just cut a shape. Excellent. What did you get? What do you have? I see a triangle. What else? A heart. What else? A square, good. What do you got? Triangle. Triangle, a heart, excellent. An oval, 
a thought bubble. All right. A random cut. Thank you. OK, now, very carefully, I'm going to have you close your eyes and cut a shape. And of course, you're grown up, so you know not to cut your fingers. But close your eyes and cut a shape. And take the other piece of paper. Take the other piece of paper and close your eyes and cut a shape. Of course, you're being careful not to cut your fingers. If you're really worried, you could, you could tear. But all you're doing is cutting a shape. A bear-ish. It's a bear-ish cartoon character. Looks like a ghost. Excellent-ish, a shape-ish. Does that have a name? It's a shape. When you, when you heard the word a shape, what did you think of? Did, you, did your mind automatically go to one of those identified shapes that we all learn about in first grade? A shape equals a triangle. A shape equals a square. A shape equals a predictable pentagon of some kind. Not everybody did. And I thank you for bearing with me. I had a question right up here in front. And she said, what I was hoping that we'd all get to at the end of this lesson, a predictable shape or just something random? Because really, truly, the direction, a shape, is quite vague. Because you all cut a shape both times. And some of them are those predictable, nameable shapes. And some of them are a shape-ish, a random construction of something. The, the point, of course, is when someone gives you an instruction, a, a fixed mindset will say, well, of course, a shape is a square. Well, of course, a shape is an oval. Well, of course, a shape is this predetermined thing. But when we're moving in a growth mindset, that phrase, a shape, well, everything is a shape. Everything is some shape. And so then we get to pick something. We get to move. We don't stop and get stuck on, oh, I don't know what shape she means. We move forward, and we create a something. So yay, you all easily looked like fluidly went there. Went to a uh, maybe undefined and undefinable but cool shape. And some of us even gave it a name. And that's also really fun. So that's, that's an example of a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And it's a, it's a kind of an indicator, perhaps, of where we are on that spectrum of being in a growth or being stuck in fixed. All right, moving along. I would like to introduce Angela Meadows. Angela is a current master's degree student and teaching assistant at UW-Madison, and she is studying library and information sciences. Prior to going back to school, Angela spent five years with the education nonprofit City Year Milwaukee. She served two years as an AmeriCorps member, working directly with students in Milwaukee public schools to help them develop a growth mindset and improve their reading and math skills. Angela also worked as a staff member with City Year Milwaukee, managing and coaching other AmeriCorps members during their service year. She did graduate from Carroll University in 2012. And I'm delighted to report that she has started working interning here at Hedberg Library with our youth services as of the beginning of this year. So welcome, Angela. I'm, I'm also going to try talking without the microphone. Is that good? OK, perfect. And I'm going to stand because I'm a little bit of a mover and a shaker. Um, I sense a trend. Yeah? <laughs> All right. Great. So yeah, so like, um, like Michelle said, my name is Angela. I, um, I grew up in Janesville, went, graduated from Craig High School. Um, and then went on to school at Carroll, Carroll College or Carroll University, as it's now, now called. Um, and as I was like ending my senior year, I feel like it was like still a little bit of the recession and like I'm a millennial, so I'm like, ah, oh, I don't really know what I want to do with my life. I'm graduating with a degree in English. What do you do with that? <laughs> um, I, did, I knew I didn't want to teach, but I knew that national service felt like something that um, 
aligned with my sort of like goals and vision for myself in the future of wanting to serve people, um, give back to communities, whether it's my own in Janesville or um, in this case in Milwaukee. Um, so I look for AmeriCorps programs found in the city or Milwaukee um, and thankfully when I applied they accepted me. So I served two years as an AmeriCorps member. Um, during that time of serving you're kind of working um, when you're working long hours, so in my case I was working 10 hour days um, in Milwaukee Public Schools earning a living stipend, so just kind of enough um, to pay rent and cover food and that was kind of it. So a little bit um, and so, like some people, it, like my view it is a sacrifice. Luckily, I have a lot of privilege being that both my parents were still working um, and were able to offer me additional support. So while I was there, I didn't necessarily feel some of the hardships of having to be living on a little bit of a less income um, than I maybe was accustomed to as a college student or growing up um, with, with my family. But during my time serving, I was really kind of one, like blown away by the organization that I was working for, Growth Mindset, um, similar to Sarah, like it's not something new. They talked about it a lot and I spent a lot of time working with students, t teaching them the idea of Growth Mindset, right? Like they, whether it's like the trauma that a student might be going through or just general disadvantages of them being in an inner city, um, and there's right, like just a lot of struggle that maybe they're facing, so how, how am I helping them see um, that despite the disadvantages that might surround them, they, they can still exceed, they can still excel, go on to graduate high school, um, go to college, et cetera. So I was working with fifth graders, um, and I remember so specifically one of my students came in, didn't really probably, I don't think, he knew English, but definitely I wouldn't describe him as a fluent English speaker, um, and was significantly behind in terms of where he was particularly with math. So I got to spend a good amount of time working with him around multiplication. Um, started the, started my time working with him, like addition was a little bit of a struggle, but we got there moving up to multiplication. It was taking some time. By the end of the year, it was so exciting to get to see him master his multiplication tables up through nines. We didn't all, all the way make it to 11 or 12s, but I feel pretty confident that he got that in sixth grade. Um, but so when I think about that moment um, and getting to work with, like, work closely with a student, talking about growth mindset, it was really easy for me to encourage that in him and encourage it in other people. Um, fast forward a few years to when I decided to apply to be a manager. Um, all of a sudden, all of the things that I thought that I knew about growth mindset seemed to go out the window. Um, I was struggling a lot, um, right? Like at that point, I was 24 never really viewed myself as a leader um, or as someone who wanted to manage other people. So I'm in a space in a pretty like high profile partnership um, with a school that was piloting um, our nonprofit and a few other nonprofits in the city kind of working together to transform a school um, with the hopes that then that transformation can continue on and it branches out to the rest of Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, so I'm in a high, high profile partnership young, managing people who are the same age as me, maybe a little bit older in some cases, and I don't know what I'm doing, right? Like, I'm trying to inspire um, inspire people to like be okay with the sacrifices that they're having to make by serving in a school that's incredibly high need. You're seeing examples of like trauma that students have experienced, um, lack of resources that exist within the school, um, and there's a lot of like helpless feeling that you have as an AmeriCorps member, um, being in a space, wanting to do the best you can, and seeing that there aren't resources available um, to the young people that you're trying to serve. So I'm here man trying to right, like in inspire and invigorate people to do their service, manage a partnership, so making sure that core members are doing the work that they're meant to be doing, that we're helping students in the way that we say that we're supposed to, um, and the service that core members are providing is the is at the quality that we really want it to be, right? Like, this work is incredibly important, um, and we can't have people in the space who maybe aren't fully invested in being in the space. Um, and I'm right, I'm like halfway through the year in a meeting with other other kind of like people in my similar position um, from the other nonprofits and from Milwaukee Public Schools, and they're talking about um, my team, my miracle members, about how they aren't they aren't as good as previous teams who had been serving, and that really like we just aren't 
city year, the work that we're doing isn't good enough, it's not up to snuff for where it is that we're supposed to be. So I'm like, ugh, like this is a completely an attack on me and my leadership and the way that I'm leading my team. Um, have like, right, like just kind of keep making our way through this meeting. I get out, have like a little panic attack, like crying in the bathroom, like what? Ah, this, how am I supposed to finish up this year when people who have more experience than me, who understand, um, who understand how important the work is and know um, how in many cases like life and death it can be if we don't get it right, they're saying that the work that I'm doing isn't good enough. Um, how am I supposed to continue on? So luckily, like I think Brian spoke a little bit about like relationships and working to build those with people who are around you. Um, one thing that was really exciting to me or like why, I've, why I'm even able to stand here now is the fact that I had relationships within the organization of people who one, believed in me and two, were able to provide a little bit of like perspective honestly of like, yep, you're not actually a total failure. There are like things that you can do that can be a little bit better, um, but like things aren't going as bad as you maybe think that they are. Mm -hmm. So I spent some time like doing a little bit of like just my own reflecting, um, read a few books about like how to manage people, what does it look like to coach others in, in a nonprofit specifically, um, and finished out that year with that team. We did really good work um, like in terms of the metrics that we used to measure success that was our best year, um, even with all the struggles that I felt like I had as a leader and others maybe felt like our team was having. We did really good work that year. Um, and when I went back for my second year, knowing like it, it, it's amazing how having people who believe in you and kind of like really like in my case reading a book about like how to sort of manage people, taking a few tools here and there, um, can really transform, at least in my case, it transformed my experience. My second year, um, like it was just like night and day in terms of the difference, um, in terms of not only our service was just as high quality, we were able to help students get back on track in a way that we hadn't in previous years, um, and all of, like all of the core members who I was working with ended their term of service, like feeling really happy. Half of them came back and decided to serve a second year, which is again a testament to the work of being able to build relationships um, and believe in yourself enough that you can like have an impact in, on others that you're working with. So um, I like I think a lot about being able to like it, it feels easy to inspire others and write like oh yes I believe in everyone in this room like being able to. Um, Make, make change and do whatever work it is that you want to be able to do to create, to make the world a better place, but how do you shift that to make sure that you're believing in yourself? Um, luckily, by being surrounded by people who were able to sort of see that in, in me, I was able to make some of that change um, and recognize my own power that I had to be able to um, actually lead and manage an entire team of my peers um, towards a successful term of service. So that's a little bit rambly, but that, that's my story and how um, being a young person working to create change in a city, um, how important it ended up being having people who believed in me to support me in that process. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. May I introduce Jodell? Jodell Wogu is currently a student, a senior at UWI Water. There she is. She's majoring in accounting and IT, information technologies. She works as a project manager for a recruiting firm in downtown Janesville. Jodell has a history of embracing change, starting with first moving to New York at the ripe old age of 24, changing careers when the mortgage market fell out in 2007, 2008, and then going back to school as an adult. So Jodell, will you come and talk with us? Thank you very much. So I think I'm going to try to just talk as well, since that seems to be the, um, hopefully my theater little background helps me project a little bit. Um, so I guess when Michelle asked me to do this, um, my first thoughts when going back and forth with her were, how do I talk about just going to school for, you know, 20 minutes? So in thinking about how, how I would, you know, explain my situation, I really realized, as others have, that I sort of have had a history of embracing change and have never really 
struggles as much maybe as others um, in you know, just going with the flow. Um, that being said, I do think there's a difference between changes that are sort of forced upon you <laughs> and changes that you choose yourself. So um, at the age of 24, as Michelle mentioned, I did up and move to New York City without knowing a soul, not having a job, um, just decided that's where I wanted to be. And um, some of it was motivated by the thoughts of Broadway and theater being there. Now, um, I did not actually ever pursue any, any of that out there. However, my experience out there couldn't have changed me more as a person. Um, I know we have been focusing a little bit on success in career, but just success in life and finding out who we are, I think that that can be just as important. And for me, it is. I still, at 40 years old, I'm finding out more and more stuff about myself that I didn't realize that I liked this or that. And I think that those things are, are very important too. So some of the other changes that were more forced upon me, which have resulted in good things, is I have actually lost my job or career path twice. <laughs> so 2007, 2008, which I think most people are familiar with, uh, the mortgage market sort of just like dropped out, at least in the subprime area, which is what I was working in. There was a lot of my colleagues who went out and found just another job in the industry. Um, however, I was out in New York and I was like, you know what, I think it's time for a change. I do not really see myself continuing to work in this um, field, partly because of the job prospectus, but also I had a bad taste in my mouth um, based on everything that had happened. So I decided to come back to Wisconsin and be around my family a little bit. I didn't know exactly if I was gonna stay or go or what was going to happen. And so I ended up just starting to work. And I didn't know exactly what type of job I was. I signed up with a temp agency. They just sort of placed me with this job. Um, I do have a little bit of a confidence in myself that I know that I could kind of just learn anything. It's always been a little bit of something that is a skill of mine. So I wasn't super worried about changing careers, but I did want to like what I was going to be doing. So I just sort of was feeling things out. Well, <laughs> then like six years later, ends up being that, you know, I'm like managing a distribution department in supply chain and I didn't expect that to me by end goal, but it, it, it was great and I loved it and I loved the company I was working for and they decided to close us <laughs> so and move all of our operations to San Diego and I guess that was an option to move there and I did consider it. Um, however, instead I decided, you know what, I don't want to have to keep starting over. Every time like the job market or, or my career kind of goes away, I have to find a new employer when I don't have any degrees, um, you know, to understand that I have something to offer them. And a lot of times what ends up happening is I start over back down here and have to work back up. And I'm like, I really don't want to keep doing this. I'm getting to an age where every time I have to keep doing this, I lose a lot of income and everything else. So I decided to go back to school. Um, I started at uw Rock County in 2012, and I was an engineering major. And uh, I did not stick with that. I was doing well, I just realized I didn't like it very much. And so I switched to taking some other classes and kind of stumbled into an accounting class, which made me go, aha, I really like this and I have a good talent for it. And so I just started pursuing that. I now am at UW Whitewater. Um, it's going well, not to say that things aren't stressful. <laughs> um, and I was about two semesters away and I got thrown another curveball. I found out that the internship program that I was planning to participate in required you to still be in school for at least one more semester in order to be a part of the internship program. Well, that wasn't my plan. My plan was the internship to be my last semester. So I'm like, well, how can I rejuggle everything? And I really don't want to be in school for an extra semester. And at first, like I said before, sometimes changes that are forced upon you don't go as well <laughs> as like the ones that you choose yourself. So yes, I was a ball of stress. I worried about it, and I just kept 
thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, I turned it into a positive, or at least I am hoping it will be a positive. So now I am pursuing two bachelor's degrees instead of one. Um, so I will be there an extra semester. <laughs> But by rearranging my classes that I already had with that additional semester, now I will end up with two bachelor's degrees and um, more career op options, obviously. Um, and to my delight, <laughs> I have found out that actually there's a huge niche up and coming in accounting right now that they really are looking for people who are very experienced in IT, IT security, um, to be able to not only audit those systems, but also advise companies to what kind of IT they can implement in their companies to make their accounting run smoother, um, to also make sure there's less errors, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm very happy now, like even though I was kind of upset and miserable in the beginning about this change, um, I find it now that I'm like, oh, this is gonna work out definitely to my advantage. So I guess that is sort of my takeaway from all the changes or things that I have done. They don't always end up in the place that you think, but they definitely, if you embrace them and make them into a positive, they can open up all brand new things for you that you just really weren't even expecting. sharing these wonderful stories of, uh, and, and there, there are certainly some themes that run through each of these lives. I'm, uh, I, I'm interested in what you all are hearing, and now is also a good time if you have questions for any of our speakers, but I certainly am hearing uh, the willingness to take even what many people would perceive as setbacks in stride. Uh, they, you know, you're hearing those changes that were forced upon each of them. A time when, sorry, you don't get to do that, try this. Or, whoops, that didn't work out the way I thought it would. Let's go in a different direction. Or even, I know, I don't know, Brian talked about this, but I know in library world, there are a lot of people who are going to say, nah, -uh. <laughs> and to have the courage and the ability and the language and the communication skills to say, well, yeah, maybe so. And, Come on along. So, all right. Yes, sir. Questions? I want to ask uh, Angela, because you know, you're, uh, you'd be a member of the Millennium Group. Is that right? For Millennial Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of curious, uh, in your own words, um, uh, let's see, how would you describe the Millenniums and what, what, what are you looking for as a Millennium Group? I mean, as you look at the world right now and so forth, uh, what, how would you describe it, and what, uh, what kind of things are you searching after? That's a great question. The question is, as a millennial, what are you, what are you looking for? What are you, what are you thinking that your generation is hoping to find in the world? That is a good question. It's hard to know if it's a result of like, the people that I've chosen, like other young people around my age that I've chosen to surround myself with, um, if that's, that might inform what my answer is going to be. Um, but I think, I think that ultimately, at least what I'm looking for is f trying to find whatever, like, right, like income is important and like money I know matters, but there's, at least in my experience, what seems to be more important is having experiences and surrounding myself with people um, that either challenge my thinking or push me to be better. Um, and to think about like how, how is it that whatever I'm doing, maybe that it benefits me, but how am I also thinking about how is it benefiting everyone else around me? Um, I think we, in my head at least, there's a little bit more of a shift back to more of a community aspect of, right, like it's not, I'm invested in myself, but I'm also invested in everyone around me and know that we're connected to each other, um, whether we, whether we want to be or not. Um, so I, right, like, whether we want to be or not. Um, so I, by having, by thinking about, right, like when I think about Right, like what do I look for in an elected official or what do I look for out of a career or relationships? Like it ultimately is for people who um, 
are thinking about themselves as well as everyone else that's around them and are cognizant of their interconnectedness to other people. I'd like to, excuse me, um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head here and uh, one of the things that I hope, I mean I'm almost 80 now so I have a, I guess a different perspective in some ways, but um, what I hope the millennials will do as well as the other uh, generations of people here it seems to me that one of the big challenges is going to be whether we have a clean environment and whether or not we have clean drinking water. Now maybe that sounds a little strange, but, um, well, the other thing is peace but, uh, and, and jobs and all that, but I'm, I'm hoping that your generation will, uh, will really work on making sure we have a, a safe environment, one that isn't all polluted, and also that we have clean drinking water. I hope so. yeah. yeah, I think we all are hoping this very same thing. Thank you. That we find ways, not only putting that just on millennials, but that all of us find ways to promote healthy, safe drinking water, um, clean environment, enough to keep us all alive and healthy as we move forward. Sarah. Um. I think, um, like what I heard with her, I think it's really important that we pay attention to what we put out and what other people put out. Because she mentioned a few times on like who she surrounds herself and how other people make her feel. So I think if we, we as people, um, regardless of what generation it is, mm -hmm. if we ourselves look at things in a positive and we put out positive and we encourage other people, that's going to help help everybody else to, um, she even mentioned in her speech that what helped her become a better leader is, is to have people believing in her. So believing in yourself, that's going to help you, but also believing in others and being able to look at situations that most other people might look at as negative or strange or weird and being able to look at that through different eyes and be like, well, good for you, like, I'm glad, mm -hmm. glad you're doing that. Because we actually had a conversation about um, children um, oh, yes. Like you can see, you can see a child, like if a child is standing and they're spinning around, it's raining outside and they're just spinning around in circles and just loving the rain, right? And if you imagine that being an adult and they're standing and they're spinning and going, people are going to walk by, or actually 50% yeah. of the people are going to walk by and be like, that person is crazy, they need to be locked up. The other 50% is going to look at them and be like, I wish I had the guts to spin in the rain like that. Mm -hmm. So that you just need to have the courage <laughs> to be that person that will spin in the rain. And then you will change all the other generations to be better also. Yes. Um, okay, so it, it's interesting to me it's interesting to me to hear what all of you have to say. And I, I should say that I probably do have a growth mindset because I've had five careers oh. in twenty years, twenty five years. Wow. Um, each of which has led to the one that I'm presently in, and, and that's a whole other story. But right now I work with little children. And because I'm more conversational than like speaking to the, the panel, I'm going to say, I think what's really important when you're working with children and with other adults is to help them to understand that all those little decisions you make each and every day that seem inconsequential, those are those decisions that contribute to this overall mindset or the overall trajectory. And, and when I think about working with kids, and I used to work with young adults when I worked in the university environment, it's like there's certain critical decisions that you can make that can set you on a path, or take you off a path, or bring you back to a better path. Mm -hmm. And do I try drugs or not? Mm -hmm. um, do, I, do I take out student loans or not? Um, if I'm 12 years old and my friends have started drinking and I can stay home and do my homework, which choice do I make? Those things, I think that needs to be part of a conversation about growth mindset. Because when I'm sitting here, I hear the success stories but failure is such a teacher. Ah, failure. Yeah. Failure Excellent. is such a teacher. Excellent. But nobody yep. really wants to dwell in the mm -hmm. failure part of it. Mm -hmm. And that is so important because mm -hmm. I think what happens is kids get real mired down in I'm so bad or I've just screwed up. And they don't understand that screwing up is part of the journey. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you very much. Micro decisions. Thank you very much for bringing up both of those points, the value of micro decisions and how they help us step to or away from an end result. And sometimes those end results are predictable and sometimes not as much. But also, how, let's talk about that panel. How do we turn setbacks, 
failures into successes or into learning opportunities? Anything come to mind, a, a time when you really felt like you stumbled and what you came, what you got out of that? Anything you would like to share? I don't know. I think in general, I always feel like I'm taking one step back and hopefully two more forward, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, you know, going back to micro decisions, bad things happen to everyone. You know, overall, you do make choices. I think your biggest choices are really what you do when those things present themselves. Um, you know, if you can, again, you can't turn every single thing into a positive, but it certainly can direct you into another place in, in your life. And um, certainly, when I moved to New York, I planned to stay there forever that didn't end up being the case. So I could have looked at it negatively. I could have also looked at it negatively that I never got on stage when I was there. And instead, I look and I say, you know what? I used to barely speak to people. I um, didn't know at all who I was. I just had a very um, controlled, sheltered childhood. So for me, I took it as success, success in the factors that changed me as a person instead of looking at maybe the negative things that, oh, I didn't do this when I was there. That was my original intention. Um, and now, I have never forgotten those dreams, though, and now I've been able to be involved in some community theater. So, you know, I, I don't know, I guess I think of it, I'm 40 years old, and I'm not super young, and I'm not super old. I'm right in that middle place where I have a big job to me in front of me to say, I want the rest of my life to always be living in my truest self and not maybe how I spent the first 20 years of my life. So um, I, I, I don't necessarily look at failures as failures just as redirections, kind of, Sarah, you had mentioned earlier. I agree. I'm not, I'm not able to, like, when you asked if you have any failures, my mind went blank because I honestly don't look at anything as a failure. I don't, and that, that probably sounds really crazy, but I just don't. It's, I might have wanted to do something and it didn't work out, but it led me in a different direction or something else happened because of it, or I'm able to find that silver lining that, okay, yep, this didn't happen, but this did. So I don't. The resilience I'm, factor. It is, so I think it's how you look at the, look at the situation, like if you, if you look at it and you let it bring you bring you down and be like, oh, I'm worthless, like I didn't get this, like I think that's a huge thing. Or or another thing I think that people take as failure is is even what other people perceive of you. Like you might feel good about it, but other people don't feel good about it. So then that makes you in turn not feel good about it. You have to realize that what other people think about you is their problem, not yours. And it gets a lot easier to deal with those things because you're not you're not embarrassed to fail and you're not invested. You're not so invested and you're not you don't get so disappointed in yourself because you're like, oh well that happened, I'll do this now. But mm -hmm. what did you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're just happier, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I kind of look at them more as stumbling blocks rather than failures. And the number one thing is when something doesn't go the way everyone thought it would. Give yourself 24 to 48 hours to calm down. <laughs> Don't do anything rash. And then, um, and then hopefully you get those people around you to support you. Because I know we had one where a whole bunch of people rallied around me and gave me support. And I got this at home too, where I'll come home and just rant, and my wife will give me support, say, "Oh, you'll get them tomorrow and whatnot." But uh, yeah, and then you, you know, after you've calmed down, you come up with a new game plan and you move forward. So that's been pretty successful for, for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jack. Yes, a question. I was just sitting here thinking of a quote that I've always believed in. It's not as important where you started out, it's where you end up. Uh, and I, I remember that a lot. And I, I think that's sort of what, you know, I think where your line of thinking is. Excellent. That's pretty the important. quote, it's not so important where you started out, it's where you end up. Kind of, I know in my mind it kind of makes me think, well, I need to keep striving, I guess. I don't think it just stops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? I think another thought I would have is uh, life is not a 100-yard dash, it's a marathon. Ah, life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. 
let's think about that topic of mentors and the people that, that have helped us being mentors or having mentors. Can you think of a person or people in your life that either you have, have really influenced you and helped you to be the person you are today, or perhaps someone that you have taught and coached and helped become more? I turn to books a lot. Like I, I love books and YouTube. Like YouTube is everybody's friend. <laughs> but um, I've always, even when I was younger, I've always been one that like I just I will get fixated on wanting to learn about something, and I would go to the library and I would get all these books and I would just read about it until I was like, okay, I feel like I mastered that, and then I move on to the next thing. And I've just always done that. So I can't really pinpoint one certain person. I'm sure there's somebody that that taught me to do that, but I've always been just very self-sufficient and uh, if I want to learn something, I find I find a way to do it. So whether it be through books or, or you, I mean, YouTube is crazy. Like, you, if you want to fix a toilet, go to YouTube. You're going to learn how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but anything, um, there are so many like, like self-help books. Um, a lot of people, they hear self-help and they're like, oh, that's weird. Everybody should read those. You should. Uh, as, as often as you can, there's so Eric Ward. I mean, there's so many people I could I could list list authors like crazy. But thank you for that, that wonderful that commercial for the library. We did <laughs> <laughs> we did pull out um, um, we I did pull out a bunch of books that I thought were um, on this topic of opening our minds from um, uh, finding your inner creativity for dummies to um, change your mind, create a new life, to many, many more. So I hope you'll take a minute and browse those. Yeah, we, there's one fewer on there because we already have somebody who found one that she can't go home without. Thank you. Are you out of your mind? That's the title. Are you? Even the audio books. A lot of people say, oh, I don't have time to read. Well, then you just throw in an audio book and you listen to it while you're washing the dishes or you're brushing your teeth. I, driving. Yes, yes. driving. Yes, audio books are wonderful. I too am a YouTube fan. What was the book that you read? Something oh, about? gosh, I can, it has a lime green cover. Let me think on it and I'll get back to you. Yes. yes. And there's, there are a lot of managing and coaching and yep. inspiring and mentoring. Um, and it's, and it, you don't necessarily have to read the whole thing from cover to cover. Sometimes holding it, sometimes reading sections or chapters that are particularly germane to your question yeah, you can be, take, take the nugget. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. What else? How else do you mentor or have you been mentored in your lives? Um, I guess I don't have any one person that I'm like, oh, this person helped me for all of these years. But I think reaching out to people who are in a position to advise you best and, and really thinking about that well. Um, I know because I am in school, I have made some relationships with professors and they are, like, there's not one I can pick out and go, oh, this person helped me all the way through, but when I was in their class or even if I wasn't afterwards, you know, they, they take a personal interest and if you take personal interest, they can really help you through some of those little difficult moments, even as just to listen. Or if it is to say, hey, you're not crazy. <laughs> um, that maybe was, you know, something that was, um, I don't know. I, I don't want to say like sometimes certain professors are going to be better than others and sometimes you have professors that can empathize with that with you. And um, so, I don't know. I guess I think that finding those one or two people who can be a little bit of a cheering squad if you don't have that like in your personal, personal life. Um, also, um, I think in general, surrounding yourself with people that are good support, um, having a similar mindset to yourself um, really does help a lot. It helps you inspire each other in a lot of ways to like, think about humanity or think about, you know, how you can do better and do more good in the world. I think for me that those are the people that I look towards because usually they have the, those qualities and those mindsets that you already are looking for. So. I'm seeing nodding all along this table here. Yes, Sarah. 
Um, I also think it's important not to put people in boxes. So like, don't look at their social status or or who they are, you know, like what kind of job they have and that type of thing, because you can learn from everybody. So, mm -hmm. yes. so like myself um, in the company I'm in now, I'm I'm at the top of the company. So. Um, that doesn't mean that somebody that just signed up yesterday isn't going to be able to teach me something. I'm not going to look at them and think that, oh, I'm better than you. Like, don't, don't ever do that. Don't ever look at somebody and think, okay, you're homeless. I can't learn anything from you because you're obviously not at the place that I am. Or, you know, just things I just use as an example. But mm -hmm. just treat everybody the same. And then, oddly, uh, people that are at a higher status and that might be able to benefit you more, they appreciate that also because they don't like being put on the pedestal. Mm -hmm. You know, some people do, but most people don't. Most people like to be just treated as a just an everyday normal person. So you just treat everybody the same. Mm -hmm. Treat helps. everybody well. Mm -hmm. And see how that goes for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Other questions from our participants, from our audience? Anyone? All right. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, we talked a little bit, Brian mentioned the elephant butts, which I was at that training, so I know exactly what he's talking about, and it's something that <laughs> is very prevalent in people's lives, and, and not everybody might have, you know, obviously you guys already have that growth mindset, and you find ways to overcome your butts, but what do you think, what do you think throws those butts in the air? What do you think um, causes people to hesitate, and how, what kind of words would you say to those people? How would you coach them through it? So the question is, how do you overcome resistance? How do you get past the, the elephant butts, as Brian put it earlier? Yeah, the, how, where does that resistance come from, and how do you help encourage people to move past them? I think it, I think it depends on the situation. So it's hard to give an answer for so many things that could happen. Sure. But um, I will always preach, uh, a lot of people, they, they're really stuck in their heads on what other people think about them. So once you stop, stop worrying about what other people are, are going to think, and step back, mm -hmm. um, you can do that. Also, if I'm giving advice to somebody else, I always ask them to give themselves advice. Because normally when you have a problem, you already know the answer. You just want somebody else to tell it to you. So just step back and treat it like a third person and be like, what would I tell myself if I was in that situation? And then you give yourself advice. You're always gonna give yourself the best advice. Mm -hmm. So most of the time you already know, you just have to step back and allow yourself to hear it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yeah, in my, in my experience, um, like in some, in some instances it may be just like stemming from cynicism, which uh, depending on the person and the situation really that might dictate how much of a conversation I'm having with a person and how long that conversation is. Um, when I think of when I was coaching um, or managing AmeriCorps members, it often fell into either like an like an attitude, which again like is a little bit more of like that cynicism idea, which is a little bit more difficult to have a conversation around, um, or like an aptitude. So like they maybe don't have the skills, and that's why they're resistant. Um, so any time I ran into someone who was Right, like, yeah, but the, this won't work because of all these reasons. I would often start by asking questions around, like, like, tell me more about why you think that this isn't going to work. And from there, I would be able to figure out, like, oh, it, do I actually need to have a conversation about, do, like, just your general, like, mindset? Like, do, I, do we need to talk about growth mindset with you? Or is it that you actually just don't feel like you have the tangible skills to be able to do this thing? Um, yeah, so that's coaching and that's like my manager's hat I guess of like what I would do if I ran into um, someone who was resistant to something that we were trying to do as a team or something. Mm -hmm. I think um, one tool that I guess I have used if if the person's reasons are often like rooted in themselves um, they don't think they can for some reason I always try to compare it to somebody else who either has done it or could do it and then say, well, if they can, why are you different? What makes you so special that you can't do it? It's almost like the reverse, yeah. you know? You're, you, you, have the, you have the abilities, you just have to believe that you have the abilities. And I think sometimes people always look at themselves and say, oh, I can't, but they would never give that same advice to somebody else. And so if you can try to get them to think about themselves the same way as they want to love and support their other people, mm -hmm. it, it helps to change their mind about how they're thinking about themselves. Yeah, definitely. I think people get 
caught into a comfort zone. It's really easy to, to do that and to get into a routine. So then you challenge the person and you say, well, you know, how would you, what would be your dream? What would be your dream? What would you really like it to be? Or what would you like different? And then challenge them and say, well, okay, what would it take to make that happen? What do you need to do? How can I help you make it happen? Mm -hmm. And then just kind of work from there. Mm -hmm. I find that these barriers come from people's fear. So to turn and ask the question, if you weren't afraid, what, how might that work? If you had all the money in the world, if you had all the time in the world, if you had all the skills, how would that end result look? And oftentimes painting a picture, taking out the scary piece and painting the picture helps people to feel like they can envision it and, and have it be more possible for them. I also often take things into the ridiculous. Um, I've had, I am a manager, have been um, in management roles for more years than I'll confess to, more than 40. Um, and I, I'll say, uh, I'll take things into the ridiculous. I'm late for work. Oh, I'm so sorry. I fire people all the time. Oh, you're late, you're fired. So I've now spoken their greatest fear. But I love you and you work well, so you're hired back. And we laugh. And then we can move on. We've dealt with the big bad, the worst of the scary things, and it wasn't so bad after all. And that can help put the rest of the conversation in the rest of the concerning context that makes it workable, manageable. So, excellent. Thank you all for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. Any last words from any of our panelists? All right. Thank you all. Thank you for being such an inspirational model for us. Oh, wait. to kind of put a positive spin on it, but it's going to be about those people who have failed and failed and then succeeded mm -hmm. um, in big ways like J.K. Rowling and mm -hmm. Einstein, but <laughs> we, we will kind of make it accessible to everyone as well. So stay, keep your eyes open for lots of programs coming up with the idea of growth mindset and mindset matters. Okay. Thomas Edison once wrote that he knows 48 ways how not to make a light bulb <laughs> and one good way to do it but 48 ways how not to. And we would, if he'd have stopped after two, we'd be in the dark, perhaps. <laughs> Let's, one last thought about stereotypes. If the library is all about books, if any of, I don't know a single librarian who truly looks like that, that lady. <laughs> and if all we do is say shh to each other, where will we be? Please know that that's not how libraries are. This place, this Hedberg Library, and the concept of libraries throughout our country are places of color and variety and culture and noise and, and learning and enrichment. So I'm hoping that we continue to move into being a 21st century library as we continue to be 21st century and beyond in our thinking. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you once again, panelists. And onward. <laughs>